Welcome to Oxford, the Oxford Internet Institute's Trinity Term Oxford Lecture. Uh, this lecture gives us an opportunity to showcase some of the world-leading expertise in the department, and tonight uh, it's a privilege to introduce Professor Vicki Nash. These events are free to all, and we're here tonight in the splendid Mathematical Institute building. Before I uh, go on to the, the nice part of the introduction for Vicki, let me cover a little bit of logistics. First of all, feel free to tweet, of course, from uh, at OII Oxford during or after the lecture, uh, but please keep your mobiles, mobile phones and cell phones to silent during the lecture. Secondly, we have no planned fire alarms, which means if there's a fire alarm, you should move to the exits and, and uh, follow the running person symbols. Uh, we'll also have some stewards to help direct you should that happen. On to business, I'm delighted to uh, introduce and welcome Professor Vicki Nash, Senior Research Fellow and Deputy Director and Associate Professor now in the Oxford Internet Institute. The Oxford Internet Institute is an interesting department. We're about a third philosophers and a third computer scientists and a third social scientists. And it lets us cover a range of topics in creative ways. And I think you're going to get a taste of how that creativity works tonight. The title of Vicky's lecture is Connected Cots, Talking Teddies, and the Rise of the Algorithmic Child. Most of us in the room will have connected devices. Uh, most of us in the room will have connected devices in our houses. Many of us will have children either living in our homes uh, or in our wider families who themselves seem connected, seem existentially tied up as if they were a net network device of themselves. As we increasingly use technology to help manage our households and make our lives easier. It's vital we consider the implications for our children. What happens to data about their preferences? What will happen to their voice in a world down the road that is more fully constructed from the information that they leave behind now before they've given informed consent? There's lots of interesting issues to consider here, and as Vicky will explain, the companies, explain the companies, governments, and civil society groups we have now have only just begun to give this some serious thought. So there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture. And after the lecture, we're meeting for drinks afterwards. So please stay for the conversation. Um, engage with Vicki or to, uh, meet some of the students and staff uh, to discuss the issues she raises. Vicki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Phil, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And uh, it's nice to be able to use my title, certainly. Um, I'm not going to use a microphone initially. I'm going to use what my children would call my outdoor voice. Um, if that's not adequate, please start making difficulty of hearing sounds, uh, signs at the back, and I will use a microphone. So the focus of the lecture tonight, as Phil said, is very much on the expanding array of connected devices that we find in our homes uh, and being used by our families. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the implications of these largely screenless devices for children's well-being and flourishing and safety. Um, and we're going to reflect, I hope, on what it might mean to keep our children safe and secure in the digital age where we experience this ever-expanding array of devices. But I'm also going to ask us to uh, do one more thing, which is to reflect a little bit on what it means to be a child and what it means to be a parent in the digital age and whether or not we think that those norms are perhaps changing as the devices around us also change. The project that I'm discussing tonight uh, was funded by the Oak Foundation, and it was a project that was established to look at the growing array of companies, if you like, that are providing goods and services with which children engage digitally in the home. Uh, I work with two fantastic researchers, I think one of whom, Hugh Davies, is here tonight, Hugh, thank you for all your help, uh, and Alison Mishkin, who can't be here tonight. So I've been at the OII since 2001, and uh, almost since the very beginning, I've worked on issues relating to children, that children's internet safety and well-being. And it's been so fascinating over the years to see how those debates have changed, how they've been reflected in the media, how they've been reflected in policy. Uh, and I would say the continuing theme, actually, has been often the, uh, the level of moral panic around technologies but often also the disconnect between the issues that are raised by media, by government, and the evidence base that we have that tells us what actual risks and opportunities children face in their daily uses of these technologies. Um, 
I think that, uh, you know, it is quite an interesting question why we, we get so alarmed about technologies, uh, and in particular their use by children. And all I would suggest, perhaps, is that I think it has always been thus. And it was the same with television, it was the same with radio, and arguably, if we went back far, it would be even the same, perhaps, with, with, with the telephone. Um, I'm not going to give you uh, a sort of how-to safety manual tonight. I think we will talk about specific tips about how to keep children safe online. But I'm not going to give you a list of instructions such as you might find from other sources like government websites, uh, the online charities. If any of you need that sort of information, I can talk to you later. I'm very happy to provide you with links uh, by email. Um, I'm going to start, though, I think, perhaps by, by starting out at the very beginning of the internet safety debate. And I wonder, actually looking at the age range in this room, um, there will be quite a few of you, I think, who remember when the internet used to look like this. Um, some of you are young enough not to remember, actually, quite frighteningly. Um, this is from 2002, and this is from the days when uh, an internet safety guidance document would have to explain, first and foremost, what the internet was. Uh, and actually, it's interesting to me that our definition has not changed hugely, that it's a worldwide network of computers. It's reassuring to know we've still got it right. Um, and in those days, uh, when this first came out, it's worth remembering the internet wasn't ubiquitous. So I think our first internet survey was 2005, and at that point, only 60% of households had internet access. When this was written in 2002, quite a lot less. Um, one of the first projects we conducted at OII while I was there was a project around what would happen when broadband was rolled out. And at that point, broadband meant anything above uh, 0.5 of a megabyte per second. So again, you know, remember how lucky we are now, even those who live in rural villages with very little internet. Um, and, you know, at this point, in terms of the types of issue that we were worried about, they were largely text-based. So uh, you can see this is a very text-based website itself. The document was almost entirely text-based with some little animation, little, little, little cartoon pictures. Uh, and it gave you a set of rules as to what to do if you were talking to people online in chat rooms or news groups, uh, and it largely, in, in many ways, is very familiar. It's, don't talk to strangers, don't give up personal details, tell your parents you see things that are upsetting. So, so far, very familiar. On the other hand, I think it's worth noting that we're always playing catch-up when it comes to the internet. There's a concept uh, introduced by somebody called Jonathan Zittrain, which he described as, as, as generativity, by which he meant that the internet, uh, it's not controlled in a centralised way. Nobody owns the whole internet. You don't have to have permission to innovate or create apps or write code. You can just use it. You can use open standards. You can roll out new tools, roll out new activities, roll out new services. And so, you know, it's unsurprising if you look at the history of internet safety that it changed fairly rapidly. Uh, you know, it wasn't all that long, a few years later, before uh, we were worrying perhaps much more around not just text-based use of the internet, um, but images, videos, content online. Um, this, of course, is one of those wonderful stock images that makes me feel really inadequate as a parent. You know, they're always smiling, they have white teeth, their children are clean. Nobody's arguing about whose turn it is to use the laptop or the computer. Um, but I put this image up there because actually it symbolises for me one of the sort of early components of uh, internet safety advice after 2002, which is around the use of the family PC, right? So... You'd give out a set of rules, certainly, but you'd also say to parents, put your family PC, your sole computer, in a family room and watch what your children are doing on it. So there's a degree of oversight, but also a degree of communication and conversation about what children might be doing online. So, you know, so far so good. It worked for them. They all look really happy. <laughs> However, it's not that long before, uh, again, with the internet, generativity, new developments, new technologies, that things are disrupted with the advent of mobile. <laughs> Again, it seems so ubiquitous to us now when we look at our, our children or kids in the street, every single one of them has their own personal screen in front of them which they can use as they wish, largely when they wish, and to quite a large degree how they wish it would seem. Um, Again, it's worth remembering this is a fairly recent development. Uh, if we go back to 2012, so iPhones, I think, were introduced 2007. It took five years, roughly, um, for uh, children to have increasing use of mobile devices. By about 12, 2012, uh, over half of 12 to 15-year-olds were using uh, technologies, internet technologies in their bedrooms, largely mobile phones, also some tablets. Uh, also, I think it's important that we saw a rise in not only iPhone or smartphone use, but smartphone ownership. 2012, we actually had 60% of children already over 12 owning their own smartphones. So, 
you know, this raised issues, if you like, for debates around internet safety. You could no longer rely on the fact that your child had a technology that they could use solely in a public space with parental oversight. Instead, you have a device that gives your child access to seemingly very public spaces in terms of, say, social media or communications with huge audiences, but in other ways, very private spaces, spaces that a parent can't automatically uh, chase their child into. <coughs> Obviously, on the flip side, this has granted children uh, some quite substantial autonomy. I mean, I said to you at the beginning that I didn't want to, to, to sort of uh, abide by the sort of rules of moral panic and make us think that these technologies are all terrible. And they're not. If I look at the way that mobile phones are used by young people today, this same privacy, this same uh, ability to pick up a device, own it, use it how they wish, obviously gives them autonomy and ability to develop their identities, their sense of self, to develop their own communicative relationships with friends, with family and if they want to play, play games all night, uh, much against their parents' wishes. But that sort of autonomy is worth remembering. What else? What else have we seen in the development of internet safety? Well, another really significant trend is the, the growth in the, the pre-literate internet user. So again, you know, it's worth thinking about how radical that is. For those of us that understood an internet initially that was only text-based, the idea that it's developed to a, to a, to a stage where you can use the internet, even if you can't read, even if you can't actually speak. It should, you know, in some ways seem quite incredible. Now, for this, obviously, we've got to thank, you know, two important developments. One is uh, apps rather than websites. You click on a, on, a, on a single icon. And the second, obviously, is touch screens. Again, you don't need to type something in. In the future, obviously, we can even use uh, sound or speech, other forms of technology as well. Now, if we think about the change that the move towards mobile introduced... The, the, the evolution of the pre-verbal or pre-literate internet user brings new challenges. You can no longer assume that you are, if you like, looking after children who can self-regulate their own behaviours. A child of three or four or two, you can't give them a set of rules and say, right, go out now, apply those, make sure you're not talking to strangers online or watching terrible videos on YouTube. There has to be oversight. And I think it's probably no coincidence that at the same time as we've seen this growth in the ever younger uh, internet user, that we've also seen a rise in the development of home or household level filtering solutions, which we have in the UK. So most of the major ISPs will offer you an automatic sort of opt-in to household level filtering that, that, that sets protection for, for younger users. We've also seen the development of ever more what we might call walled gardens, which are, uh, if you like, um, uh, apps or, or, or websites which <coughs> offer pre-approved content. Um, again, ideally uh, good for younger users. It's, it's worth noting that these are a significant user group. In the last Ofcom survey uh, carried out last year, they regularly survey uh, young children's internet use. It's worth noting that I think more than a half of this age group are regularly using the internet to play games, watch television online, watch video content. Uh, and that amazingly, nearly a fifth of all three to four-year-olds have their own tablet device. <laughs> what would your grandma say? I mean, it is. It's amazing. So... If we reflect on, on that, on these internet developments, um, we've been conducting, uh, you know, many of us over the years, lots of internet-related research to try and understand what sorts of risks and opportunities those technologies bring to children. And for a long time, thanks to the, the great work of a colleague called Sonia Livingston at London School of Economics and her EU Kids Online project, we typically understood risks around the internet in three broad categories. So content-related risks, so seeing things online that, that were problematic or potentially harmful, which might include violent content or pornography or um, nowadays hate speech. Contact risks, whereby you might meet somebody online who had uh, nefarious aims towards you, so harassment or stalking uh, or grooming, for example, all those awful things that, that, that we were encouraged to fear, particularly in terms of things like stranger danger. And then last but not least, the third C, conduct, the idea that children themselves are not only uh, uh, vulnerable, innocent little actors who have things done to them, but might themselves act in a bad or negative way towards others. So again, the third risk being seen as things like children undertaking themselves uh, harmful activities, maybe uh, illegal file sharing or illegal um, gambling or um, creating sexual content, for example. So... That's really, uh, if you like, the, sort of the, the, the main way in which we've framed risks around the internet relating to those technologies as I've set them out thus far. Uh, I'm going to suggest that one of the things we might need to do uh, as the range of devices we're using in our homes is expanding, is that we might need to revisit this and wonder whether this provides a fully adequate account 
of internet safety uh, and risks in the digital age. So we'll come back to this later. So first, let me illustrate for you uh, why I think we do have some new challenges ahead. Did anybody buy this for their child? No, maybe you're not going to admit to it anyway. Um, this is uh, a wonderful doll called My Friend Kayla. Uh, My Friend Kayla is a good example of an internet-connected toy. She uh, connects uh, to a child or a parent with an app, and she is able to respond to a child speaking, recognise what the child is asking or telling them, and give, via the internet, an adequate, one hopes, response. So it's an interactive internet-connected toy, enables you to have a conversation with your toy. I mean, we always have combinations with our toy, it's just that they Im we imagine them replying, they didn't actually reply. Um, Kayla uh, is interesting, we'll talk about her a bit more later. She was actually classified as an illegal spying device um, by the German government um, because of her potential to record children's conversations. But putting that aside, I'm just bringing her up here as an example of the type of connected toy that we might find in our homes. Other examples uh, could include, uh, for example, um, furry toys that can actually communicate hugs or emo messages of emotion to a child from a distant parent or relative. Uh, Toys to Life is uh, a set of games, things like Lego or branded, uh, branded figures, which a child can use to engage in an online video game at the same time. Uh, and then also um, things like uh, quite an, a new array, actually, of sort of puzzles or even things like Jenga that you can now use in a connected way. So there's a whole array uh, of these new internet-connected toys out there. It's interesting when you toy to the toy, talk to the toy companies, as, as, as we did, as Hugh did. Um, it's uh, currently quite a niche market, but it is expected to expand very dramatically. I think the predictions from the market research are that by about 2022, you'll be seeing around half a billion items each year being produced and being sold. So on the one hand, uh, policymakers keep saying, it doesn't matter, there's not many of them out there yet, you don't have to worry about this. On the other hand, the toy companies are saying, yes, people are going to buy lots. They're really successful, making lots of money. So, you know, we have to wait to see which one it's going to be. Second type of device that we're finding in our homes, uh, again, being used by families and children. Uh, this is the Echo Dot. It's an example of a digital home assistant. Again, for those of you uh, who, who may not have one of these or, or, or haven't seen them, uh, effectively, it's a bit like a, a screenless internet. You can talk to this device, you can ask it for things, you can tell it to do stuff. Uh, very often it's used uh, as a way of just simply playing your music now. You don't need to own a CD anymore. You, knew. you simply say, you know, play X track and it delves into Spotify or Amazon or whatever. Kids love them, they tell them jokes, uh, largely clean jokes, not always. Um, but the, the array of things that these devices can do for you is incredible. But again, interestingly, you know, no screen, so it is a direct and unmediated, if you like, engagement with, with the internet. These are also very popular. Um, I think uh, if you look at the most recent LSE figures for their um, security and privacy survey, these are now in around about uh, one in ten children's houses. So again, we might think of these as at the moment still being premium goods, and that probably is the case, but my sense is that they are uh, you know, growing ever more steadily, and indeed, with the release of the child-friendly versions of these technologies, uh, I suspect we'll see even more of their emergence into children's bedrooms around the, around the country. Okay, and then last but not least, uh, another area that I wanted to pick up on is what's called baby tech. Um, there's a consumer electronics fair in Las Vegas every year, which is where you go if you want to see the, sort of the latest, craziest most exotic developments in the, in the tech world. And it's been notable that for the last four years, we've had uh, a whole area of this, of, this, of this consumer show devoted to baby tech. Now, what this is, uh, is basically um, devices that we can use in the home, on our children, with our children, to uh, extract and then generate data about our children that then inform our parenting. And these range from something like this, which is obviously a temperature monitor. You don't need to do that thing where you stick a pokey thing in a child's ear and expect them not to cry. Um, instead, you have a nice, a nice strip and a digital readout. But it also includes things like smart nappies. Again, who knew you needed a smart monitor to tell you if a nappy was full, but apparently you do. Um, also, uh, the connected cots that I had in the title. This is, again, a very serious development whereby you can have connected mattresses, for example, which register a child's motion and movement overnight, will analyse their sleep patterns for you, but most importantly, for example, maybe notify you if the movement really ceases. Um, and again, we'll talk a bit more about that later. So 
This is, uh, again, just another example of the array of connected devices we might have in our homes. I'm not going to mention the ones which, if you like, not focused on families, but clearly there are also now smart doorbells, home thermometers, uh, smart fridges, you know, you name it, you can, you can largely internet connect it these days. So uh, for the moment, we're going to focus on the child and family related ones, but, but the other similarities arise with those too. So... In the research that we conducted, we were really interested to try and find out a bit more about the array of companies, as I said, who are interacting with children through these digital products and services. And we were driven to do so because we were interested in, the, uh, in what seemed to us a very narrow perspective of governments on a certain sector of companies when it comes to internet safety. So if I say internet safety to you and you want to think about who the government's berated most recently, it'll probably be Facebook, it might be Microsoft, it might be Google... Um, but it almost certainly won't be one of the manufacturers of these sorts of products. So we were interested to know what types of companies are there that are manufacturing these, these goods for children, how are they thinking about internet safety, and what are the implications of what they are or are not doing for our understandings of internet safety. As part of that project, we conducted some research to see whether there was any evidence of risks and harms arising from use of these products. And I'm relieved to say that on the one hand, we didn't find evidence of, for example, those three Cs that I gave you at the beginning. So we didn't find evidence, for example, of uh, stuffed teddy bears being used by strangers to groom children in their own homes. Uh, we didn't find uh, evidence of uh, too much disturbing content being delivered via devices like uh, Amazon Home Assistant, although there were a couple of incidents I noticed um, recently, I think there's a lot of concern, isn't it, about sort of, you know, sinister laughing appearing in children's bedrooms, I'm not sure that's a problem. Uh, and also one of the dolls, the doll Caleb, could be, for example, hacked to deliver swear words. But those are all exceptions. So again, if you go back to those three Cs that I talked about at the beginning, content, contact, conduct, we didn't find a great deal of evidence of risk arising. But what we did find was plenty of this. So these are articles here, um, just picked at random from the media selection that our uh, review uh, pulled out, and uh, they're fairly typical, and they focus on one thing, which is data breaches and data security. So what we uh, discovered uh, was that although there's no evidence of harms resulting to children directly from the use of these internet-connected devices, we are seeing, you know, on quite a significant scale, actually some very shocking lacks of security in these devices, even from quite reputable companies. So VTech, for example, the one that's named there, you know, unlike the Cloud Pets manufacturer, which I think was IQ, which was a small company, a recent startup, VTech, you know, big international brand, supposedly uh, been marketing and developing children's toys for a very long time. You expect them to have a strong sense of responsibility towards their young users. And yet even though not only were they hacked, but the data was actually held ransom online, right? So uh, we felt that this was uh, concerning. Some other issues that arose around uh, data security specifically. So, you know, the first thing that these items, these, these, these articles remind us was, first of all, many of these devices that are being used in our homes and our families are, like every other digital device we use, collecting data in a fairly routine way. Now, on the whole, we assume that the data will be collected and it will be transmitted and stored in a secure way, and we have regulations, the General Data Protection Regulation, recently introduced in Europe, that's supposed to ensure that, that happens. But it seems that um, nobody's immune from hacking. That's the first thing. So you can be a big, responsible company and still get hacked. Secondly, you can be a small startup company and you can be trying to keep your costs down pretty low. And actually building uh, sufficient security into these devices with a small profit margin is quite difficult. And it might come fairly low on your list of priorities. So, you know, it was interesting in cases like the Cloud Pets one that even when the security flaws are pointed out, the company's concern didn't really do anything about it. They didn't recall the products. They didn't try and fix the flaw. They sort of just, just raised their hands uh, and didn't know what to do. The third thing, I think, uh, that we noticed in terms of these data insecurities is that even if you don't uh, point the finger at corporate practices around whether they are behaving responsibly or not behaving responsibly, Obviously, there were lots of places where actually parents' own behaviours would, would make what seemed to be you know, potentially secure products a bit insecure. So things like products coming, for example, with the default password set on them. And most of us, you know, our busy lives, we've got so much else to think about, never changing the default password. So again, making it easy for a hacker, if they wanted to, to hack into that device, potentially gain access to your home network and lead to, 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 to some sort of data theft. So... 
This was the most alarming uh, incident we discovered. And I, I raise this, again, not because I want to cause any sort of moral panic, because it was just one, it was just, you know, sort of one set of examples. But again, just to show you how severe these data hacks could be. This uh, is a screenshot taken from a website called spycam.cdn7.com, uh, which basically was a website revealing images of people's homes um, through hacked baby monitors. Mm. Now, again, I raise this not because any direct harm came to those children. It didn't. I think the parents are fairly freaked out. In a couple of cases, uh, parents reported having voices coming out of their, their digital baby monitors. Uh, clearly, that would be very distressing. But no child was harmed. The reason I put this picture up there... I can't believe it's our IT officer who's got his mobile phone turned on. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's probably going to be me in a minute. Um, the reason I put that picture up there is because when that particular scandal emerged, I looked at that and thought, right, you know, my goodness, this is it. This is the moment that the government is going to say, wow, there's this whole array of other companies out there making digital products for kids that we're not even paying attention to. Maybe we need to think about data protection and child safety a little bit more carefully. But it's like they looked at that article, they went, yeah, children's webcams being breached, no, we don't care, and they just moved on. So, you know, if I think about one of my main policy messages here being this long tail of other corporate actors who have responsibilities for child safety, who are not currently being engaged in government debates, you know, this is a great illustration of this, and I can't understand why uh, our, our, our digital policies have not updated. So... To summarise really on this first section, um, I guess my conclusion from our interviews with all these companies and our review of the media coverage is not that the three C's, content risks, conduct risks, contact risks, are irrelevant <coughs> in the era of these connected devices in the home, but that actually we might need to worry a bit more about other types of risk which don't seem so well covered by that framework and which are specifically related to data, data collection, data transmission, data storage, data analysis. Uh, you know, I think we all understand that when we use digital devices, internet connected devices, that we are leaving effectively a digital footprint of some sort. But we assume that it won't matter because even if it's not going to be eroded by the sea, we assume that it'll be kept secure, it'll be, it'll be used legitimately. And I think one of the things that I would hope is that is doubly true in the case of data that's collected for and about children, but it's not the case. So... For me, I think this has two main implications. One is for policy and one is for practice. So on the policy front, first of all, I think it means ensuring that the types of protections that we extend uh, to children in the manufacture of toys, for example, or goods that are, that are meant for children, we've long had protections around simple things like electrical safety or minimum toy standards. First of all, we just need to update those to allow for the fact that many of these things come with an internet connection and parents need to be sure that that internet connection doesn't bring new risks, particularly around data insecurity. Uh, I know that some of the toy associations are, are developing their own guidance. I think it's unlikely we'll see kite marks in this area, um, but at the very least, we would like to see major retailers much more aware of the, uh, the need for sort of minimum data security requirements being sold with their products. Um, the second uh, area, though, I think that, that needs some significant updating, as I keep referring to, is around the business context. So, you know, this is a list here. It's uh, the list of partners who support something called internetmatters.org, which is a uh, coalition of the willing in the UK supporting one of the major sort of UK uh, internet safety campaigns. Um, it is one of an array of self-regulatory initiatives in the UK uh, that the government uh, asked, asked people to volunteer for. I always like that phrase. It asked them to volunteer for, uh, um, with the threat of regulation hanging over them, but still. Um, asked them to volunteer for, and you know, they are, you know, to their credit, doing great things, providing resources, providing support, supplied, providing advice to help keep children safe online. On the other hand, you know, I look at those logos. This is just a handful of, the logo, of logos of the companies that we saw engaging with kids in the home. Uh, you know, who are not on that previous list. So that would include things like uh, purveyors of public Wi-Fi. Uh, those of you, again, who have kids, particularly teens, will know that they become very cunning about knowing where the public Wi-Fi is so that when they're outside the house, they don't have to use the data. Mm -hmm. Toy companies, I've mentioned. Uh, uh, media companies, content providers. Uh, Angel Sense, we'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, they're a tracking device provider. Uh, Outlet, super awesome. There's this huge array. I mean, I could go on. I could have so many slides of these different companies. But as I said, they're, they're not really anywhere to be seen, even in discussions around what we currently have in front of us in the UK, the online harms white paper, which is a new approach to trying to uh, develop 
self-regulatory and potentially regulatory solutions to keeping kids safe online. So that would be my first message is, yeah, let's make sure these companies are doing their bit. The second part uh, of this, though, is really around not policy, but practice. And I said at the beginning that I wanted to uh, get all of you to reflect a little bit on what it might mean to be a parent uh, in the digital age. So it, it might feel like an odd claim to those of you who are uh, outside academia, but there is in uh, the sociology of childhood an understanding that childhood itself is a concept that is invented. Right? I know that sounds ludicrous because, of course, there have always been children. Um, but what it means is that we, we haven't always thought of children as innocent and vulnerable and uh, economically dependent and emotionally fragile, uh, you know, like the children you know, play, they're playing so beautifully with their dolls in this wonderfully innocent way. Um, actually, in reality, our concepts of childhood have changed over the years, and they change in relation to two things, the social context in which we find ourselves and actually the technologies that we use. So, you know, obviously, uh, in Victorian times, you know, we didn't think that it was wrong to put children in the mines uh, or up a chimney. Uh, we didn't mind particularly if they worked in factories and mills where they would lose fingers or, God, you know, God forbid, even limbs at times. And, it, you know, it, it wasn't because, uh, you know, necessarily parents loved them any less. That was just what economic circumstances and the regulatory system and social norms required, right? Childhood was different. Um, you know, even going back a bit more recently, perhaps, to an era where children played in the streets. Uh, you know, I love this picture. You know, clearly this is a time where uh, technology was different. There were fewer cars on the streets. Um, you could go and play with a go-kart without any parents overlooking you. There was no television. There was no alternative to doing this. This was the most exciting thing you could do. Um, so again, you know, the concept, or our understanding of what good parenting involved even 50 years ago, was slightly different. Uh, you didn't feel neglectful if your kids went out and did this. You weren't going to attract any social opprobrium for allowing your children to do this in the street. So I'm not sharing these pictures uh, to indulge in any sort of false nostalgia, suggesting that the internet or pre-internet era of childhood was somehow you know, wonderful. Look at all these kids playing wholesomely in the street with their homemade toys. Um, I'm not. I actually think that the internet era has delivered amazing benefits for children uh, you know, even just in the era of entertainment uh, and, and, and downtime. But I'm introducing these images here for you because I want us to really understand this point that I'm making about how far our, our expectations of childhood and our expectations of parenting are very much influenced by the era in which we live and the technologies we use and the society we find ourselves in. So I'm going to show you why I think this matters and why I think it means that we need to reflect a bit more carefully on how we parent in this digital age. So this is uh, an advert for something called the Owlet Sock. Other vans are available, I'm told, um, are now available in the UK. And it is literally, it's a small sock. You put it on your baby in the cot and it tells you what their heart rate is and it tells you what their blood oxygenation levels are. And this is the slogan, love more, worry less. Uh, I think the other advert I've seen in the UK, the tagline is rest assured. And the, the whole product uh, is sold on the basis that it's going to give you, as a parent, more peace of mind. What the product does, um, it uh, tracks blood, level, uh, sorry, blood oxygenation level and heart rate within certain agreed, uh, um, pre-agreed um, boundaries. And if it, if it goes outside those limits, uh, you get an alarm to your mobile device uh, and also a sort of a base station in the home. So the idea is it's supposed to let you sleep more soundly as a parent without becoming really anxious. Quite expensive. Um, I also picked this because I noticed this is one of the co-founders, and I don't know if he's been made up to look like Keanu Reeves, but I suspect that might have had some additional appeal to some sleep-deprived mothers, I don't know. Um, I use this example. So A, it's collecting data from the baby on a, on a you know, continual basis. B, it's then analysing that data, and C, it's then generating, if you like, a response to parents without the need for the parent to go to the cot and see if the child is okay. So it is a data-driven uh, app. 
Um, on the other hand, though, you know, it's not necessarily uh, the wonder that it seems. Uh, the company does in the small print note, for example, this is not a medical device. It's not regulated uh, in the US by, say, the FDA. Uh, in their FAQ, it says, uh, this is not intended for use as a medical device or to replace a medical device. It does not and is not intended to diagnose, cure, treat, alleviate or prevent any disease. And it goes on and on and on. Right. So, so many caveats about what it cannot do. But yet at the same time, rest assured, go to sleep, let the data do the work for you. Don't worry about your child. Right. It's the second example. So this is uh, AngelSense. This is one of the very many kids' tracking devices that's available on the market at the moment. Um, I picked this because actually it's got a really wonderful story behind it. Uh, if you want to think about why these things are great in use, you, you should look at the story behind it. It's developed by a parent of an autistic child, and it's for use purportedly for children with special needs so that parents can track their whereabouts at all times um, um, a particular concern, for example, if they leave school uh, without permission, if they leave the home without permission, uh, these are, you know, it's intended for children, this father says, uh, you know, for whom simply you know, being required to obey the rules is just not enough. You need to keep them secure, you need to know where they are. Uh, the device is uh, um, uh, and it's enabled with a two-way voice system, so you can talk to the child if you think they're lost. Uh, it comes with real-time GPS tracking, so you can, again, a bit like you can with Find My iPhone, you can see where they are, you can see them in real time. Uh, and importantly for kids uh, with special needs, they, they come in a variety of different forms that you can wear easily that won't uh, upset, uh, you know, won't, won't be offensive to the sense of touch, for example. So you have, you know, sleeves, I think, and a shirt and so on. On the other hand, um, you know, that sounds really wonderful and that clearly brings peace of mind and security to parents who are really, really worried about where their children are. But on the other hand, you know, that's quite a small market. And if the company's relying just on those parents to buy that technology, it's not going to get very far. So actually, you know, what everybody's really hoping is that most parents will go out and buy these technologies to put on their kids so that they know where they are at all times. And it's worth noting in that context that these are part of the same array of technologies that are used by domestic abusers to keep track of their partners when they want to know where they are so they can control them, right? So let's just think a little bit carefully about whether we need to have data on where our children are at all times, and if so, why? And last but not least, uh, another you know, data-driven innovation, again, that purports to bring parents great peace of mind uh, in a very complex and very worrying digital era. Um, this is uh, an award-winning uh, um, social, mon social media monitor. Uh, you use it as a phone app, and it basically analyzes your kids' uh, phone usage to see whether there are any very worrying uh, instances of behavior. So, uh, for example, it can, um, you install it on the, on the phone and it monitors things like email, texting, instant messaging. And I think it's got a list of around 20 different social media apps, including all the kids' most popular ones. And what it does is it will send parents alerts on an array of topics, ranging from, and I quote, uh, cyberbullying, depression, predators, access of adult content, again, all which sound, you know, why would you not want to know if your kid is, 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 is any of those situations or is accessing that sort of stuff? On the other hand, it effectively means you're spying on your kid's internet usage all the time. And if you think about that, if that was not on a phone, that would be spying on your children's conversations all the time. And that would feel different, I think. So again, I'm, you know, uh, each parent makes their own judgment for their own child. They know the vulnerabilities they're trying to address. But I just put these out there as examples of the way in which these new data-driven tools and apps are, I think, potentially shaping the way that we parent. Now, what all three of these tools for me exemplify, I suppose, is the end point of, uh, the logical end point of the new data-driven economy. Um, in all those cases, and the ones I didn't talk about, you've got this perfect relationship, sort of symbiotic relationship between companies on the one hand who are making products that appeal to parents, particularly worried parents, that are going to try and keep their children safe. Uh, but those companies want to make money, and they also want to collect data because data is useful to develop new products to make more money. Uh, we also have children who maybe do want to be kept safe, but also want a bit of freedom. So uh, they also happen to be very good data subjects. So they will sit there and enable a parent to put a tracker on them, put a baby sock on them. And they will provide, in return, a very valuable data stream. Valuable to parents, valuable to companies. Again, symbiotic relationship. So we've spent, I think, at the OII and beyond, you know, a great deal of time over the years thinking about internet safety and, and how to keep our children, uh, you know, literally flourishing in the online context. 
But what we're now faced with is this growing array uh, of companies that, in theory, it's, you know, these companies, they don't rely on children using the internet. In a way, it seems to me like this is the internet using children. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, think about that, I think, as a sort of little, little role reversal. And I think that, you know, perhaps in the future, um, one of the things we are going to need to think about rather more is where this takes us. So, I mentioned in the, the title of the talk this concept of the algorithmic child. And, you know, this is a very abstract concept. I'm not even sure where it's going to take me in, in my next work. But, you know, for me, what it really summarizes is this, this question that keeps coming back to me about what type of parent we want to be, what type of parents we want others to be, what type of concept of childhood we have in a world where uh, all of these devices are collecting and generating ever more data about children, about our families and about our homes. On the one level, it seems uh, quite likely that these are making our, our lives safer, better, healthier, uh, more informed. It seems like a really, really positive uh, development. But on the other hand, just as we're worrying about the impact of algorithms in other areas of our lives, whether that's uh, algorithms and in giving us car insurance or not giving us car insurance, whether it's algorithms deciding what adverts we see online, do we really want algorithms making ever, having an ever greater role in our children's lives and in our parenting decisions? Do we want to be the sort of parent that decides our child is sleeping safely because we have a data feed? Or do we want to be the sort of parent that decides our child is sleeping safely because we put them down and we know we might check on them now and again? Do we want to be the sort of ch parent that knows their child is safe outdoors because we trust them? Uh, or do we want to know that they're safe because we've got a monitor on them, a tracking device, and we know where they are at all times? Again, everybody has to make their own decision, but I think uh, overall what we might be seeing is a, uh, a move to a new era where our reliance on child-generated child data and algorithmic decision-making is ultimately going to change the way we parent. And I think that we need to think about that a little bit more. So overall, I hope I've made you think about two possibilities. The first, that we need to expand our understanding of Internet safety to allow for this array of devices in the home which are generating data about children, which is not always kept securely. So should we be holding companies a bit more responsible for that? And secondly, do we need to reflect on uh, our understandings of parenthood and childhood in a context where we're using this ever-expanding array of <laughs> devices? And we maybe make sure that we are happy with the ethical choices that we're making when we buy these technologies and use them in our own home. So, thank you very much. I think we have time for questions, if anybody has any. Or speculation or comment, also fine. Um, yes, Taha. Thank you very much, Ricky. Amazing job. Um, uh, one topic that I wanted to know if that's relevant at all is the perception of parents from child and children's point of view. You know, uh, all I could know about, you know, uh, my, my parents' early life, after I reached a certain age, was, you know, go through their pictures. Um, the first album that we had, uh, whereas my potential children could go on Facebook and see many more things about me. So I have much more profound online presence. Mm. Um, is that something that could be also discussed in this kind of So children knowing more about their parents? More or a different image or a kind of digitalized image, mm. perception. So we are talking about algorithmic choice. Do mm. we need to also talk about algorithmic parents? <laughs> No, it's true. You could imagine a scenario, couldn't you, where, you know, reflecting, for example, on a you know, long-gone parent, that you are left with their, you know, their social media legacy and whether or not that would be the same memories you would have of them as you would if you reflected on your face-to-face your, your -face experiences with them. So you're right, it does work certainly both ways. I guess I, I, am, I am more concerned with it this way around because of the power differential. So parents are making decisions about children's lives um, based on data that's given to them by private companies. And I think on the whole, those decisions would be more influential than, 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 if you like, the other way around, what children are thinking about their parents. But you're right, it absolutely would apply both ways. Yeah. I'm gonna, I was going to say I'm going to try and go boy-girl, so we have any girls. Yes, OK, thank you. I mean, one of the things that I find really makes me very uneasy is the whole, um, what they're doing in China about the social credit rating, where you get rated if you go and see your parents, you won't look up. Mm -hmm. You know... We laugh about it in the West. We say we won't do that, but surely there's, you know, th there is now the data potential. If we gather all this data on our children, something similar to take place. You know, are you a, a bad parent if you say to your children, "Do you want to go out and play? I don't care where you go, just come back to tea." Does 
does that make you a bad parent if you haven't got the device to track the movement? And I think that's, um, you know, certainly when, when our boys were younger, I can, I'm made to feel quite guilty that I sent them across the road and up the shop by themselves, mm. aged eight. Mm. You know, and there's that sort of feeling that, you know, I think we need to be very careful about pushing back on some of this. You know, it, it's worrying. Yeah, I mean, there's always there's always a worry about how uh, corporate data will be used certainly in authoritarian regimes, where there aren't the same protections between the state and the private sector. Um, I suppose in this context, one of the things that I would find alarming would be whether whether we might see the same development around, say, health insurance that we've seen for car insurance. So, you know, the possibility that you have a black box in your car that discerns whether or not you're a careful driver or not. Um, with the rollout of these devices, would there be any use of these that might enable you to have access to cheaper health insurance, for example, because you're you're monitoring your child's well-being in some other way. So there are certainly outcomes further down the line that I think I would find de very discomforting. Although, I mean, not so, I, yeah, right, partly because it would reflect badly on, on parents, but also just because I think it sets up um, inappropriate incentives, perhaps. Um, but, yeah. Okay, uh, Yorick at the back. Thank you for the talk. The topic you didn't touch on, and I thought you might, and I wonder if you have any views or evidence on it, is... The view that Susan Greenfield of this university banged mm -hmm. on about a lot in recent years, that a uh, phrase was that the constant interaction with devices was rewiring children's brains. I mean, just a metaphor, of course. But, I mean, she plugged this very hard and got a lot of newspaper publicity that somehow, you know, constant contact with devices was essentially encouraging antisocial and semi-autistic <coughs> behaviour in children. I wonder if you have any views or evidence on that. I have a polite, well, an impolite and a polite view. Um, uh, I mean, the, the polite view certainly would be that, that if uh, I, I'm very happy to uh, allow that as a possibility, but I would like to see the evidence. And I think, you know, what was unusual, if that, that initial, one of the initial headlines I think that I put up was related to some of her claims. And what, is, uh, un, you know, what seems unusual about that to me is that she's an academic who spent all of her life developing, you know, platforms and opinions based on academic evidence, but that was an opinion that wasn't based on academic evidence at the time. Um, I mean, it's interesting, I've certainly, probably like you, I've seen some studies that suggest, for example, that the way we remember is different now, uh, that on the whole, we, you know, maybe because we rely more on things like Google, we tend to hold less information uh, front, of, front, of, front of mind, um, but I've not seen, there may be others in the audience who have, I've not seen evidence that, that backs up those claims whole by, by any means. Yeah. Any other ladies? Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, lady here. Yes. Have you um, done any work on the ownership of the data that's generated? By the children and how that's managed and is it monetized, monetized and sold on and how and, and the control of, of that because it seems to me that all this data is, all this data is being uh, generated by people either intentionally or unintentionally and there's a huge market out there for that and how do you control that or should you control that Absolutely, that's a really good question, and um, it was certainly a topic that we touched on uh, in the interviews that, that Hugh did, uh, and there were, you know, there were some unclarities around it. So, uh, as a starting point, the, the, the GDPR, the new regulatory framework, um, although in theory it sounds as if you, companies shouldn't be using data from children and monetizing it, you know, they can use it legitimately for product development, for example, to, to develop new products. There are tighter restrictions on whether they can use it for advertising, but even those actually... It, it's not been tested in courts as to whether or not they can use it to target highly profiled advertising at children. Um, so yes, it certainly is being monetized. In the interviews we conducted, um, we also noticed, particularly in the smaller firms, actually some, just some unclarity about where the data was going and how much they held. So, uh, you know, there's this whole, again, it's not obvious when you use the internet, if you, if you, if you, if you download an app or anything that's likely to serve your adverts, you think you're just engaging with the company that makes the app but you're not, you're engaging with uh, usually an ad analytic network, an ad server, uh, you know, and there are so many sort of other players in this ecology. And so, you know, it was a bit worrying to us that, 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 that particularly some of these smaller companies, they couldn't for certain say that all their data was housed, you know, on site and in-house and utterly under their control. And I think that will be something that, you know, we need to watch in the future, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Just, just something to the mm. conversations with people around um, kind of, data being individually owned, so the data that I generate is yep. owned by me, and therefore I could monetize yep. it, and, and, and whether it's a healthy or whatever. And um, the same could be said of my children's data, and how that could be individually monetized by the people who generate it. Absolutely, and you know, if you look at someone like Tim Berners-Lee, I think that's still a vision that he would hold, that we'd find a way of, of regaining control over our individual data, but yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to see how we rein it all back in. 
Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big influence. Yeah, thank you so much for the, the presentation. Really great uh, things to think about. You brought up some different forms of regulation. You mentioned others, oh, some things that just completely aren't regulated. You are, which are some sort of regulation, some voluntary, quote unquote, uh, self regulation across the parts of the sector. But I wondered if, you know, just thinking a little bit more about the types of, of interventions that, that you want to see in policy, or the types of Virtual regimes, and I guess the thing that made me think about this was the, the comments about OLED and uh, and sort of all this about it not being a medical device, etc. I have a college age, uh, college friend from from way back, and his sole job uh, with a large company is to ensure that new devices do not become classified as medical mm -hmm. devices because the cost, the regulatory compliance, see for that, which just kill the you know, you know which just sort of kill the innovation. So his sole job is basically to direct companies in such a way that they can skirt the medical uh, device regulation because they don't want to fall into that regime. But of course, yeah, it seems like not having any regulation is your problem. What you know, is there a middle ground? What you know, what should we we strive for? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think, I mean, I wouldn't want to see it go down the very strict route that, that, that all of these devices have to be regulated in this very, very heavy way, which probably would crowd out innovation. Uh, as I said before, I think a lot of these technologies are, are genuinely received very well and very enthusiastically by parents. Um, but it does seem to me that actually, you know, even if it's just advertising standards regulation, for example, you know, if something's not a medical device, but it's claiming to monitor, monitor you know, things like blood pressure. So I think that ought to be there in really bold type on the website, not hidden away in an FAQ. Um, so even just, I think, improving our regulations around advertising transparency would be a step up. And it may be in the longer term, actually, that we need to have, you know, maybe there'll be new categories, regulatory categories introduced, which, which allow for these sort of midway, where you're not making clinical, you know, clinical judgments at all, but, but they may have clinical implications. Um, but yeah. Yes. I'll just shout. Just shout. Go on, use your outdoor voice. Just, okay. Uh, I wondered if it was completely clear uh, where the data rights sit with children. So, you know, is it just like a knife edge thing? You get to sort of 18 and suddenly you have all your data rights and then do you have them going back in time as well from when you were 17? You know, any perspective on that? So it is really interesting um, in a nerdy kind of way. Um, right. <laughs> I'm quite nerdy. <laughs> Uh, when, so let's talk about Europe rather than the US. Um, when the GDPR regulation was introduced in May last year, uh, at, the very, at the very last stages when the regulation was being all packaged up and delivered, uh, conversations were going on in private rooms, what we call trilogue discussions, which is between member states, um, about suddenly what the, if you like, digital age of consent should be. And up until that point, there'd been very little mention of it, there'd been, very, there'd been no research or consultation uh, around what the digital age of consent might be, but suddenly, and we don't know quite why it occurred, whether it was to do with some other sort of political uh, um, uh, sort of exchanges, but it was introduced as being 16. At 16, you'd be allowed to go online and uh, your, your consent to yourself to having your data collected and used, but below 16, you would require some level of parental consent. Now, um, some countries didn't like that, so actually we ended up in a situation where you have all sorts of different ages around Europe. So it's very complicated for a company that's operating across Europe uh, UK is 13, I think France is like 14 or 15, some countries are 16, but you in theory will have to check you know, the exact age of your young internet user before you can discern whether they themselves can sign up legitimately to have their data used. Um, but your retrospective question is a really interesting one. So for example, uh, you know, again in the UK we've had the five rights movement aiming to protect uh, children's digital rights online, and one of the things they propose is that when you get to 18, you should be able to say to any company that you've engaged with digitally, I want my data deleted, remove it. I am now an adult, I can make adult decisions about my data profile, and I don't want it up there anymore. Again, you know, that's not been, uh, that's not, you know, being implemented in, in, in law, it's not being challenged. Um, so there are these huge grey areas, quite frankly, around exactly this question of um, different things. So you know, when, you, when you can consent, when you're old enough, uh, uh, whether you actually own the data, even when you're old enough, whether the companies do, and whether you can ever get it back again. So. You know, in theory, you think it's be really clear in law, but it's, it's unfortunately not. Uh, I'm going to go any... Um, yes, Bernie, yes, and then Dan, Danny, yeah. And then Kate. We've got time for a couple more, actually. Should we take maybe three, the last three questions, and I'll answer them all. So. 
Thank you for that, Vicky. It's been delightfully provocative. Oh, good. Uh, one of the, I mean, one of the things that uh, caught my eye, particularly with respect to surveillance, was the monitoring of messages and things, which are messages to someone. Yeah. It's not just a, it's not just a diary. It's there's somebody else in there whose parent may or may not have consented uh, to that. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the social production of parenting through sites like Mobsnet or mm -hmm. Facebook, where, where this is not. This is, I, I want to see the, some, some thoughts maybe on the sort of the, how we situate this parenthood in the sort of social production of parenting. Are these things that parents are feeling pressured by others to adopt? Um, other than, I mean, I know it's the worry, but, you know, do we, do we hear stories of like, everyone on the neighborhood's got an Amazon device but mm -hmm. us? <laughs> or, or worse than yes. that, you know, your parents are like, you don't track your child, you're not coming to the party. Yeah. I mean, where do we, where does that sit? Yeah. I'll do three in a row, so thank you for that. Um, Annie? Um, as somebody who worked in some of these companies, <laughs> <laughs> big ones and little ones, um, we, did, uh, we did some research around parenting as we were, Caroline and myself, we both worked for Vodafone, so we did a lot of uh, research through other companies that do this quite well, focus groups for parents, and I did it across Europe at one point, found very different big differences between parenting culturally. And I noted that you referred to the word trust um, in terms of, oh, do you want to be a parent and trust your kid? But we found, we found profound differences culturally in parenting. In the Northern Hemisphere of Europe tending to be much more, you know, building trust with a child, talking, blah, 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 particularly Scandi countries. Southern Europe, much more kind of hands-on, you'll do as you tell, a bit more authoritarian. That's a little bit rash, but you kind of get the idea. And then, as I've been working with American companies and dealing with America, you know, versus here, uh, much more helicopter parents with control, or much, you know, more authoritarian than the kind of liberal notion of parenting. So I don't know whether your researchers thought about those kind of narratives or constructs of so-called parenting, which is a problem term in itself in terms of def definition and what that really means. That's a great question. And then Kate, I think, the last one. I can just ask, lovely. Uh, we'd actually touched into both of the questions already, and I was wondering how, if you have any ethnographic insights as to how parents, sorry, I have this now, stop screaming, um, how parents incorporate the findings into their decision making. Um, for example, with digital tech, we know that a significant number of people don't really engage with the data and use it to justify their existing practices. Um, so if you see any kind of corollary with parenting decision making. Hmm. Really good. Uh, last question. Thank you. Um, on that last point, no, we haven't done any work with parents to understand how they're using this data, how they're using these tools and techniques. Nikki, you're sitting over there. Are you doing that sort of work? A little bit. A little bit. But at a very unique point in terms of transition to first-time parenthood. Yeah. So there is work being done, and you're in the public health now? Primary care and engineering. Primary, primary care and engineering within Oxford. So other people are doing that great work, thankfully. <laughs> um, cultural differences in trust... So uh, I think this is something I would like us to explore a bit more. I mean, I suppose in a way it's a corollary of, as well as the point that I was making about parenting and parenthood being a sort of construct. Uh, you know, clearly, as you say, it does differ by, uh, you know, not even just by era, but by also country. Um, one of the ways in which I would be interested to know how that plays out is actually in to, do, in relate, is to do with the companies themselves. So, you know, we, we talk quite a bit about whether companies like Facebook and, and, and Amazon and Microsoft have a sort of fundamentally American approach to things like free speech, for example. I'd be very interested to know whether different assumptions about parenting might be being built into some of these technologies that we're seeing coming from different parts of the world. So uh, I, don't have any, I, I don't have a clear answer or any evidence to say, yes, we've definitely seen that, but I think um, I would expect that you might see different products developed with different assumptions being made, but also probably used in different ways uh, in different country contexts. So, yeah, that would be good to add to that ethnographic study. Um, and then last but not least, Bernie. So, yes, first of all, you're right. Just that little reminder that every time we monitor a child's message content, we're also messaging the, we're, we're monitoring the content of the people that they are talking to or talking with. Uh, I, I, I mean, part of me also sometimes wonders how this is allowable under GDPR, for example, um, but certainly it seems to be at the moment. Um, are parents pressured to adopt? I mean, my God, there's lots of parents in the audience, and I suggest to you we ask some of them uh, after drinks, but we are just. Now. Sorry? We are now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You'll have to have all these technologies now. Um, 
my sense is that it, yeah, it's, you, yes, it's the norm. You know, even if it's not uh, by mum's net, it's more likely by your kid quite often. You know, X has got an Xbox, uh, an Amazon Dot Echo, etc. Why can't I have one? Um, I think whether or not we'll see the same develop around all these tools that promise you promise you a safer child, uh, whether we see social press in those ways, you know, it'll be quite interesting to see. But I, yeah, I would expect so, to be perfectly frank. So, yeah, thank you. Should we go have a drink? Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you.